methods of reducing air pollution. Okay, so basically there's four ways we can reduce how much air pollution uh, we're putting into the atmosphere, okay? First of all, we can uh, engage in what are called conservation practices where we basically try to conserve energy and burn less fuel. Uh, the other one, and probably the most effective one, actually, is regulation practices. So, so if we put in place laws and regulations that that limit how much pollution we can put in the air, that's the most effective way of, of achieving big term uh, changes. Mitigation technology is another one too. So, there's there's technological changes that that can capture pollutants, and and often though. Uh, these come about because of regulations. And the other one is alternative fuels, finding things other than fossil fuels uh, to, to use to uh, generate electricity and move us from place to place. Let's start with conservation practices. So that basically we're saying these are efforts made to intentionally re uh, reduce the amount of air pollution that's being produced by, by burning fuels. And so let's just look at some examples, okay? You can make personal choices, consumer choices, right? You can say, I'm going to try to drive less. I'm going to try to use public transportation. Instead of buying an SUV like everybody does in America, I'm going to buy a, a compact car that gets better better uh, fuel efficiency. Uh, maybe I'll reduce the temperature of my home uh, in the wintertime or not make it as cold as my air conditioner in the summertime. I'll try to eat food that was grown locally so it doesn't have to be flown across the world. I'm going to use appliances that don't use as much electricity and so on. So those are, those are conscious decisions that we make uh, to to do our part, so to speak, okay? Uh, and also then you have companies, and companies engage in conservation practices. Sometimes they do it to save money. You know, energy costs money, so they want to save it, so they, they they insulate their buildings better, or they, you know, they uh, encourage carpooling among their employees. Uh, uh, basically, they do it to save money, they do it to meet regulations, and they do it to build goodwill among their consumers anymore that, you know, if you are an, uh, environmentally, conscious company, uh, there's a benefit to you for that. Right? You get some good press. Now, conservation technologies, uh, like things like technologies that come into place that help us reduce the amount of uh, energy we use. This happens all the time, right? So cars have gotten more and more aerodynamically designed, uh, better fuel efficient electric cars are even more energy efficient. So, so there's technological changes that can help us reduce the need for energy. Uh, and therefore we burn less fossil fuels and put less junk in the air. And a good example is lights. Like when I was a kid, this is what a light looked like. It was an incandescent bulb, okay? And if you want to get 80 lumens of light out of it, okay, you had to have 60 watts. So 60 joules per second of energy had to be consumed by that light bulb in order to make your house uh, light up. And by the way, if you touch those bulbs, it would burn the crap out of you because they got really hot. They were very inefficient. Then when I was in, uh, graduate school, maybe after that, okay? But they came up with compact fluorescent lights. I immediately got rid of all of these and replaced my all the lights in my house with this. Why? Because I looked at these numbers, look at this. It's, it's, it's way less, it's like, like four times more energy efficient. I get the same amount of light for a quarter of the amount of energy. That means my, my light consumption is requiring four times less fossil fuels to be burned. Now, the problem is these things uh, had, had to have like uh, substances like mercury, so they're not, not that great. Uh, so they had to be disposed of carefully. Then they came out with LED lights. For the longest time, LED lights would not work at all. They were only like red ones or blue ones. And they finally were able to come up with white ones. Uh, and once they did that, uh, it's a little bit more energy efficient than compact fluorescent, but it doesn't have the nasty chemicals in it and it lasts a lot longer. So it's just a, a question of how technology as it improves allows us to use less energy. All right, so that's conservation technology. The big one where the money is really is regulatory practices. When governments pass laws uh, for the purpose of reduction, po reducing pollution, you know, they have the ability to Im impose fines, uh, to give tax breaks. So they have a lot of ability to implement change. And, and we as citizens of a d democratic society have the ability to choose the people who lead our country and let them know we want you to take care of this. We value the air we breathe. We value reducing climate change. So, so we have the power to pick our, our politicians and therefore they should answer to us. And when they do, they can write laws that allow us to, to, to reduce pollution through regulatory practices. So uh, 
Here's a classic example, a classic example, and one that's going to be on the test, I promise you that, okay? It's called the Clean Air Act, all right? And I've, I've talked a lot this year about how it's like, man, in America, the air is great. It didn't used to be, not until this happened, all right? So in 1972, uh, about the time I came back from the Philippines as a child, the U.S. adopted a, a, a regulation called the Clean Air Act. And at the time, the main purpose was to get lead out of the air. We'll talk about that in a minute. But basically, it did a couple of things. It established an organization that's very powerful in America called the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. And it set air quality standards. It said this, you know, you cannot have more than this much of these things in the air. And if you're putting more of that in there, you you face fines. You, know, you face consequences. And and as a result, people figured out a way how to not put those things in the air. It it led to you know the invention of new technologies. It led to changes in practices. This would have never happened without regulations. Regulations have teeth; they work. The other thing that happened with the, uh, the Clean Air Act is it set these NAAQSs, and it was National Ambient Air Quality Standards. It just said basically, this is what air should look like. Right. This is how much CO is acceptable. This is how much NOx, how much SO2, how much particulate, how much VOCs, and how much lead. And it put them pretty aggressively low. And it was difficult for people to, to get to them at first. Now, prior to the Clean Air Act, uh, cars tended to burn what's called leaded gasoline. Now, leaded gasoline basically... <clears throat> It, it allowed you to, they, they, they put a substance into the, 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 uh, the oil refineries. They put the substance down here called tetraethylene. This is an ethylene, and you, you connect it to, uh, let, four of them to let, it's called tetraethylene. Tetraethylene, it allowed the gasoline to burn as though it was a higher grade fuel. So you could have an inexpensive fuel that burned like an expensive fuel. So everybody wanted it. All these cars used it. It was all over the world. Everybody used leaded gasoline, right? Uh, but the problem is, where did that lead go? Well, it went out the exhaust pipe, and it went into the air, and it went into people's bodies. And the problem is, lead is a substance that bioaccumulates like most heavy metals. It's particularly detrimental to the uh, developing brain of children, so it caused neurological problems, uh, intellectual deficits uh, in, in children, uh, reproductive problems in women, a variety of all kinds of health problems in adults. It's bad stuff. There's no level of lead that's acceptable, it turns out. Uh, and so they put these very low levels of what's acceptable. And you know what? All of a sudden, people were saying unleaded gasoline. They totally phased out leaded gas. Um, so the Clean Air Act had a profound influence on the quality of air in the United States. In fact, look at this graph. This is amazing. So there's different ways of looking at it, but I like this one the best. Okay, So... <laughs> A, uh, I think this is from the National Park Service did a study where they said, well, you know, there's these lichens are a good indicator species for uh, air quality. And they, they absorb different things. One, they absorb lead. So they just, they just, they basically sampled the amount of lead present in these lichens growing in these forests in this one national park. And look what happened. 1920, in the 1920s is when they first started putting lead into gasoline. And then after the world, after World War II, lots and lots of people started driving and levels went really high. And this is about the time that America got very concerned about it. This is about when they put in place the Clean Air Act. And look what happened. Lead levels came right back down. My point being, regulations work if they have teeth to them, okay? And it forced people to do things. They, they, people said, like, no one's ever going to buy another car. You had to pay for our gasoline. Well, that's not true. Uh, it, you, you can impose these rules and people will follow them and it makes things better. It can be done. Now, one of the things that happened though was because you couldn't pollute as much, it, it led to uh, a way of making money, which is I'm going to invent a technology to help mitigate the problem. And so there's two mitigation technologies in particular I want to talk about. And you need to know about one is called catalytic converters in cars. And the other one is industrial scrubbers in the smokestacks of factories and um, electrical generation facilities. Now, catalytic converter is an amazing technology. It's just amazing. And by the way, these things cost about two to three thousand dollars. Your car would be two to three thousand dollars less without one than with one. But you know what? Nobody's going to say to do that because they work so amazing. Well, here's what it does. It, it goes into the exhaust of your car. So exhaust from the engine passes through this. And when it comes out, it has been clean of so many things. So it reduces VOCs. 
you know, X and CO, the, the, the three main things that cars contribute to, to bad air quality, it take it, it re reduces them tremendously. So basically it has this honeycomb inside it of ceramic, high, high temperature ceramic. And embedded into that are these metals that act as catalysts. And these catalysts are able to precipitate the reactions of bad stuff into things that are less harmful. Let's take a look. So remember, a catalyst is a substance that uh, usually what it does is it bends a molecule and that causes the molecule to undergo a certain reaction. And, but it doesn't, but it does take part in it. It's not a reactant, it's just when it's there, it bends the molecule and you know, changes the energy needed for the reaction occurs, the reaction occurs. But it doesn't get consumed, so it just, it just keeps working and working and working. Now, the catalytic, uh, the, the catalyst that's in these catalytic converters is the, these, these metals. Uh, and these metals are like platinum, palladium, Rhodium, these are expensive metals, okay? That's why catalytic converters cost two to $3,000. But look what they do. Carbon monoxide is in the waste stream. It gets it to react with oxygen and it comes out as CO2. Nitrogen oxides uh, come in, it reacts them with CO. Ah, look at that, that's clever, right? And what comes out? N2 and CO2. That's so clever. You get one bad thing to react with another bad thing. What comes out is NO2 and CO2. Now, grant CO2 is not good, but it's not it's not a um, it's not an AQI pollutant. Okay, it, it's a global warming pollutant, but not AQI pollutant. And then VOCs, volatile organic compounds. That's usually what we mean by that is unburned fuel. There's gasoline that didn't get burned up. It went through the process and didn't get burned up. So what happens is as it passes through there, we just get it to react with oxygen and get it turned to CO2 and H2O. So look, carbon monoxide. Nitrogen oxide, VOCs, all of these get taken out of the waste stream simply by passing this honeycomb that has these metals embedded. It's genius, okay? So what comes in? NOx, HC is just basically for VOC, it's just hydrogen car hydrocarbons, okay? Uh, and CO, and here goes through the honeycomb with all the metals in it. And what comes out the other side? N2, uh, H2O, CO2. And look at this, 90% of the AQI pollutants that go into it from the from the engine come out as this. Only 10% of them come out. So so imagine this. Imagine if we took all of these off all the cars here. That means we'd have nine times more air pollutants than we have right now. These things are amazing, and they only came about because of a regulatory uh, pressure. Now let's talk about in industry. Okay, so. Uh, with industry, we've got a different thing altogether. So we've got, we're, we have this coal exhaust. It has lots of SO2 and, and NOx and particulates. Those are the main things that we have in these, okay? So we have these things called industrial scrubbers, and they come in three varieties, okay? And basically what happens is the instead of just letting the smoke go straight into the air, you make it pass through a scrubber, and it will take out most, like a catalytic converter, it's going to take out most of the pollutants. And what comes out is mostly just CO2 and H2O. Now, there's three types of these scrubbers. There's wet scrubbers, dry scrubbers, and electrostatic scrubbers. We're going to talk about each of those, all right, in turn. So let's first talk about wet scrubbers. All right, so basically what happens is the exhaust gas comes in with, with it's like an acid gas. So it's got SO2 and NOx, things, you know, uh, chemicals that cause acid rain. What we do is we spray a liquid against the smoke stream, and this liquid is going to have in it uh, chemicals that are going to neutralize the SO2 and NOx. And that means that we have things that are basically like bases. So we have sodium hydroxide, calcium carbonate, calcium hydroxide. So these are things that are known to neutralize acids. And so basically, as it goes through this mist, uh, it neutralizes the acids and they end up accumulating in the bottom here. Also, it takes out the part, small particulates as well. So it, it, it's able to, 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 what comes out is really, really clean. Like, uh, I want to say something like, I think like 99% of the, of the pollutants that come in are removed before it goes out. All right. Now, where does all this stuff end up? Well, it all ends up in this water at the bottom, the scrubbing solution, right? So we're pumping in this, this uh, uh, basic slurry, basically, this, this basic liquid, and it's neutralizing the, the acid compounds and taking the particulate matter out, but all of that ends up here. And so that we got to take this out and, and recirculate it and clean it and dispose of it. And, and although it does get 99% of the pollutants, which is amazing, that's why they have great air in America because they require this on everything. 
uh, it's expensive, and you have the problem of, of liquid wastes are not good to work with. They're tough, okay? But it works. Then we have dry scrubbers. And the, the whole idea of a dry scrubber is let's get away from the liquid waste because liquid waste is a pain in the butt, all right? So instead, uh, what happens here is it's is a very similar idea, all right? Uh, the, the gas comes in, but now what we're spraying it with, instead of spraying it with a liquid, we're mostly spraying it with a, a, a damp, but still mostly dry. It's like, it's still... It's, it's powder, but it's a, little bit, it's a little bit of a damp powder. It's not liquid, it's just damp powder. And this damp powder, is, as it blows around in there, it captures these particles. Uh, and, it, and it's basically, I think, I think what they use here is like pulverized limestone, really. And, and what it does is uh, it captures those same pollutants and then it gets filtered out. And then the air, after it passes the filter, is, 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 is clean of these things. So it catches like 98% instead of 99. Still very, very effective. Uh, and although they're expensive to, to, to purchase and operate, that you save money uh, because it's easier to deal with the solid waste than it is with the liquid waste. But it's the same idea. So we have we have dirty gas comes in from here. We blow in this these these dry particles, these, well these damp particles, and then they just come out the bottom. And we just collect them here, and the ones that don't go through here, we pass through these filters. So it comes out here. This is where the gas comes out after it's gone through these filters, and then. The, the stuff that comes out of these photos comes out down here. So you're achieving the same thing, but without uh, a, a bunch of, of, of liquid in the bottom of your of your uh, scrubber. And then we have electrostatic scrubbers. This is what you have in your house, right? If you have an air purifier in your house, like we have in the classroom, it's an electrostatic scrubber. Back the other day, I was sitting in the room when everybody, nobody was there. I saw hearing this weird click, 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 click. And I looked all around and I realized this, there was something like a hair or something that was being like shocked inside the thing. Okay, so here's the deal. In this case, here comes the exhaust gas. It's going to pass through a metal mesh that has a strong negative charge. So as the particles touch this, they'll pick up a negative charge. Then after pick up the negative charge, they pass through these metal plates. And these metal plates have a positive charge. So the SO2, the NOx, and the particulates, which picked up a negative charge, now are attracted over to here where they then stick to this and then fall down to the bottom at what comes out doesn't have these things in it. So we're basically using uh, the attraction of positive and negative charges to pull it out. Uh, so this is a better diagram here. So basically here is a mesh that is a metal mesh that has a negative charge. The dirty thing comes in, it says particulates, but it's not just particulates, it's also SO2 and NOx. It touches this, they pick up a negative charge, they get attracted to the metal plates and what comes out the other side is basically uh, pollution free. Here's maybe a better one here. So we can see the gas here coming up. Here's the negative charged mesh comes up here and then it gets attracted to the positive. And then what it does, remember negative plus positive is neutral. So these neutral particles then fall down into these catchments and are then taken out. So that's how these scrubs, I think that's it for it. Okay, so that is uh, how we reduce pollution. Thanks for watching.